All right, hello everyone. Welcome to the first lecture of Aero 4540, which is all about spacecraft attitude, kinematics, and dynamics. So if you remember, the difference between both is that kinematics is the study of motion from a geometrical point of view without involving any external forces and torques on the motion, but dynamics is where we would go and apply, say, Newton's second law, F equal MA, and apply then external forces onto the system. But before we derive those kinematics and dynamics equations as they pertain to attitude motion or rotational motion of the spacecraft, the first thing we need to do is to review some basic fundamental aspects related to orientation of two reference frames and uh, also rotation matrices and things like that that we all saw in Aero 3240. But let's first do a quick review on that and then we're going to build upon this review knowledge to learn some new tools and new aspects that are related to spacecraft rotational motion as a rigid body. Okay? So let's jump in. Chapter 1. The spacecraft attitude kinematics and dynamics. All right, so the first concept I'd like to review with you in this lecture is the concept of rotation matrices, the 1.1. And the reason why rotation matrices are quite important is in this course is that if you remember from orbital mechanics, rotation matrices are there to describe or represent the orientation of one reference frame with respect to another one. That was the first use, of, first use of rotation matrices. The second one was to transfer components of a given vector that were expressed in a given reference frame to the components of the same vector, but this time seen from another perspective or alternatively, in other words, expressed in another reference frame. So in terms of spacecraft attitude, dynamics, and control problems, this will happen all the time because the objective of a control system for spacecraft attitude would be to point the orientation of a spacecraft, say, towards the, the ground for Earth observation missions or towards a distant star or towards the sun for some scientific measurements. So all this is relating the orientation of one rigid body say the spacecraft, with respect to a given orientation in space, or in other words, describing the orientation of a reference frame attached to our spacecraft body, with respect to a fixed reference frame that's going to be attached to the center of the Earth, and that one is going to be the Earth-centered inertial reference frame. That was our ECI reference frame that we learned about in orbital mechanics, okay? Now, the new reference frame I'm going to play with here is the body fixed reference frame. So, what we're going to do is to attach a, a triad of unit vectors, or alternatively, a reference frame, it's the same thing, to the rigid body, which is our spacecraft. And we're going to locate the origin of that reference frame at the center of mass of our rigid body. And the actual orientation of the x, y, z unit vectors that are composing the body fixed reference frame are going to be aligned based on, uh, say, the payload that the spacecraft is carrying with it. Could be a camera, could be a laser sensor, could be a spectrometer, or could be also aligned with respect to a docking port if the mission is to bring that spacecraft and dock it, say, with the space station, something like that. Something like that okay? So the X, Y, Z orientation of our body fixed reference frame is going to be dependent on the mission, uh, the purpose of the spacecraft, or and or its payload that it is carrying. But what is not going to change from the body fixed reference frame is that the origin will always be at the center of mass of our spacecraft. Okay? And this is why rotation matrices are so uh, important in this course because again, we'll be looking at describing the orientation of the body fixed reference frame attached to the spacecraft with respect to the ECI or Earth centered inertial reference frame and go from there, okay? So 
let's consider two reference frames that are generic for the, dis for the purpose of the discussion. So I'm going to call the first one reference frame A with its x unit vector towards my right, its y unit vector up, and its z unit vector normal to the plane of the board or i.e. looking at you. Okay? And the reason why I could determine the orientation of this is just by taking the right-hand rule or the cross product of AX with AY, and that always gives you the direction of AZ, which is out of the board, okay? So that is one generic reference frame and a specific context of spacecraft attitude dynamics in control. That could be, for example, the body fixed reference frame attached physically to our spacecraft. And then I'm gonna consider another one oriented differently. And I'm going to call this reference frame in green, say B. Bx, By, and Bz normal the plane of the whiteboard. Okay? Now, what we can easily do, and we've done this in orbital mechanics, is that we can express the unit vectors comprising body fixed Oh, not body phase, but reference frame B, that, as a reminder, is denoted by this calligraphic capital F subscript B. That means reference frame B, whereas reference frame A is denoted with this calligraphic capital F letter, and again, the subscript of the reference frame in question. Okay? So what we're going to seek here is to write the unit vectors of reference frame B has a linear combination of the unit vectors of reference frame A. Okay, not that big of a deal. So I'm going to write Bx equal By equal and Bz equal. And the reason why I do this is because I'm just considering that those Unit vectors are just three random vectors in 3D space. I'm going to express them in terms of a linear combination of three other vectors that are orthogonal. Okay. So as a linear function of AX plus AY plus AZ, like that. And I'm going to do the exact same thing for BY. So in other words, expressing BY is a linear combination of the unit vectors of reference frame A, like that. And same for the third vector, which is BZ, in terms of AX, in terms of AY, and in terms of AZ. Oh, in other words, I'm going to write, say, BX equal to a scalar that multiplies AX plus a scalar times AY plus a scalar times AZ. So I'm going to scale these three unit vectors, AX, AY, AZ, according to uh, what I'm seeking, which is BX here, okay? And the scaling factors will simply be denoted generically by the letter C and subscript XX because this is the mapping between AX and BX the mapping between Bx and Ay is going to be denoted by C, X, Y, and similarly, the mapping between X and Z is going to be denoted by C, X, Z, and exactly the same for the other six remaining scaling factors that are going to multiply the unit vectors of reference frame A. So here we're gonna have C, Y, X, C, Y, Y, C, Y, Z, C, Z, X, C, Z, Y, and C, Z, Z, just like that. Okay? Uh, this way of writing those three unit vectors as a linear combination of AX, AY, AZ unit vectors isn't the most convenient because it's not the most compact way to write those three equations because you see that we are repeating always the three a unit vectors on the right hand side of those three equations. So to make things a little bit simpler in terms of writing expressions, we'll simply combine 
what I have here on the left hand side in a column matrix, three by one, in which I'm going to enclose the unit vectors of reference frame B. I'm going to say this is going to be equal to a three by three matrix that contains the scalar uh, factors that multiply the unit vectors of the reference frame A. So here's going to be a collection of CXX, CXY, CXZ, CYX, CYY, CYZ, and CZX, CZY, and CZZ. Okay, so I've just grouped all the scaling factors, the C scaling factors that are just nine random scalars that are there to make sure that combining those three unit vectors in red will give me the X here and similarly for the other ones. So I just combine them in the three by three matrix and that means that this three by three matrix needs to multiply a column matrix three by one that contains the unit vectors of reference frame A like that, okay? And you can easily double check that this matrix equation is equivalent to those three scalar equations by just doing some linear algebra. So BX is going to be equal to CXX times AX plus CXY times AY and plus CXZ times AZ. And that's exactly what we had here for the first expression. And you could double check BY and BZ and you'll realize that uh, they are exactly the same essentially, okay? Good. Um, that's great, but that's not good enough. We can do better than that. Because if you remember the concept of vectrices, yes, they're coming back. Okay? They're coming back. So a vectrix, again, just as a quick uh, refresher, is a matrix, a column matrix that contains the three unit vectors associated with a reference frame. So here is a vectrix because that is a column matrix, three by one, that contains not scalars as we're familiar with or as we typically see, but this time my column matrix contains unit vectors and not some random unit vectors, but the three orthogonal unit vectors that uh, compose a reference frame. In that case, that would be the vectrix related to reference frame B because here's a collection of the unit vectors of reference frame B. And similarly here, right, we have a column matrix that contains the three unit vectors of reference frame A. So that is vectrix A. That is vectrix B. And therefore, I can rewrite that a matrix equation in an even more compact form by making use of the vectrix notation, which is calligraphic F, capital calligraphic F, subscript of the reference frame in question. I'm going to use the uh, arrow on top of this symbol to represent the fact that this is a mathematical object that contains vectors, right, and not scalars. So that's the way to write uh, a vectrix equal to, here's a three by three matrix and I had denoted arbitrarily the scaling factors with C's and with different subscripts. So I'm going to refer to this matrix as C, B, A, and you'll understand in a second why I'm using B, A for the subscripts. But also don't forget that on the board, whenever I'm going to write the matrix, I'm going to identify it by the underlying notation. And this is to make the distinction between a matrix the underline, a scalar, which is just, as usual, letters or symbols, and vectors that have the overhead arrow notation, okay? And that was the very first thing we saw in orbital mechanics, the distinction between scalars, vectors, and matrices, and how to denote them. Okay, so on the board, matrices are going to be denoted by the underline notation, whereas in the lecture notes, uh, I had the luxury of just writing them using bold fonts, okay? But obviously writing bold fonts on a whiteboard isn't the most practical thing. So 
for the whiteboard notation, I'm going to use the underline. Okay? So this is a 3 by 3 matrix here times the other vectrix. So vectrix A, the vector symbol like that. So that is quite interesting because now we have just rediscovered, because hopefully you guys knew that already, the first use of a rotation matrix. And the first use is to represent or mathematically describe one reference frame with respect to another one. Or alternatively, alternatively we could say that the first use is to represent the orientation of reference frame B, in that case, with respect to reference frame A. Huh, and that was the key idea behind rotation matrices that we've talked about previously in this lecture, right? When I said the goal is to represent the orientation of, say, the body fixed reference frame with respect to the inertial reference frame, which is centered at the earth and inertially fixed, it doesn't move. Well, turns out we can do that uh, attitude description through a rotation matrix because that is actually what a rotation matrix does. And the subscripts of a rotation matrix are paramount, okay? Because CBA, I'm going to put it in words for you, actually describes the orientation of reference frame B with respect to reference frame A. So B with respect to A means that the rotation matrix is B with respect to A, left to right to the subscript. If we had, for example, CAB, then that would describe the orientation of reference frame A with respect to B, which is not the same thing as B with respect to A. Okay, so if you had this CAB instead of CBA, you would need to have your reference frame A or vectrix A on the left hand side and vectrix B that would multiply the rotation matrix. And the, the trick I used to remember which one goes where is again just looking at a subscript of my reference frame of my rotation matrix, sorry, right? So here I have B on the left side. And therefore, I need to have the B on the left side for the subscript here. The Bs are next to each other. And then I have the A on the right-hand side, so I need to have the A on the right-hand side, the rotation matrix, or alternatively, you could say that the A's are kind of together and the Bs are next to each other as well, right? And similarly here, the A's are right next to each other in terms of subscripts and the Bs are next to each other as well, so that works out. So that's just a little trick to easily remember uh, what reference frames you need to write around a rotation matrix or what rotation matrix you need to use to go from one reference frame to another one, okay? So that is the first use of rotation matrices. And that is to describe the orientation of one reference frame with respect to another one. Now, it turns out that people also refer to rotation matrices as direction cosine matrices, or DCM for short. Okay? So let's just say that rotation matrices are equivalent in terms of wording to direction. cosine matrices or DCM. You'll see that often in some astrodynamics uh, textbooks or some journal papers written by researchers. I personally always refer to rotation matrices as rotation matrices, but the wording direction cosine matrix is also widely uh, employed in the field. So just make sure that you are familiar with both terms and understand that they refer to the same mathematical object, which is your C matrix, okay? Now, the reason why people 
refer to rotation matrices as DCM or direction cosine matrix can be demonstrated as follows. So if you take what we had, vector B equal to rotation matrix CBA times vector A, like that. And if you were to take the dot product on both sides of that equation with the transpose of vector A, then you would get vector B dot product transpose of vector A equal to C B A times vector A dot product with itself transpose and that. Let me just switch marker because this one is becoming a bit faint. Okay? Which hopefully I won't do the demonstration in this course because I assume that you remember a few things from auto mechanics and one of those is that the dot product of a vectrix with its transpose always gives you the identity matrix 3 by 3 denoted by I 3 by 3 okay and that a 3 by 3 times identity matrix would just give you the matrix we had in the first place so CBA so then we can say that CBA our rotation matrix can be mathematically calculated by taking the dot product of vector X B with the transpose of vector X A because that's what we had on this side. So I just flip this equation upside down uh, to write CBA equal to this. Okay? All right. Well, that doesn't tell me why it's referred to as direction cosine matrix. Well, hold on a second. Let's keep going with the right-hand side here and write that CBA. And here I'm going to I am going to expand what vectrix B is. So vectrix on its own is just a column matrix with the unit vectors of the reference frame of interest, B in that case, dot product with the transpose of a vectrix, which then turns a column matrix into a row matrix. But this time this is reference frame A. I'm using the unit vectors related to reference frame A, obviously, like this. Okay. So let's keep going with that and see where we end up at. So CBA, well, good news is that 3 by 1 times 1 by 3 does give me a 3 by 3, right? Because a rotation matrix in 3D space is always a 3 by 3. If you're looking at a planar example, Planar space, the rotation matrix would just be a two by two. But here, uh, to keep things as general as possible, we always consider that we're seeking the orientation of the spacecraft with respect to some reference frame in terms of three-dimensional orientation. So indeed, this is three by three. So I'm going to prepare a big matrix here, three by three, which is going to be filled with nine dot products arising from this uh, matrix operation, which is a dot product. So the first element is going to be BX dot product AX, BX dot product AY, and BX dot product AZ. Here we have BY dot product AX, and you just keep going and fill up this matrix with all the different dot products that are coming from this above expression. By dot product AZ. And here we have BZ with all the A unit vectors. Y and BZ dot product with AZ. Here we go. So that is for the rotation matrix and describes the orientation of reference frame B with respect to reference frame A. This is quite interesting, especially if you do remember the definition of the dot product of two vectors. Because if you do remember that definition, you'll be able to quickly write that this 3 by 3 matrix is just a bunch of cosine of different angles, right? Because the dot product tells you that you need to well, dot product in the first place 
is giving you a scalar at the end of the day, not a vector, okay? Although it is a vectorial operation. So that scalar you get out of the dot product is going to be the norm of the first vector times the norm of the second vector times cos of the angle between those two vectors, okay? It turns out that all the vectors inside this matrix are unit vectors because px, by, bz all have magnitude of 1, and similarly for ax, ay, az. So the magnitude of the first vector times magnitude of the second vector will always give you 1, and then cos of the angle. So essentially all you have left is cos of the angle between the x, ax. Here you get cos of the angle between bx, ay, and finally cos of the angle between the x, a, z, and so on and so on, okay? It's essentially just a bunch of cos of nine different angles that are there to describe the respective orientation between each individual unit vector involved in both reference frames. And this is why this rotation matrix, or any rotation matrix, is widely referred to as direction cosine matrix because essentially in terms of math it is just a bunch of cos trig function that describes the direction or orientation of one reference frame with respect to another one. So just kind of a side note as to why uh, rotation matrices are widely referred to as direction cosine matrices. Okay, so now that we've understood the first use of rotation matrices, which is to describe the orientation of one reference frame with respect to another one. Let's have a look at the second use of a rotation matrix, which is more a practical, pragmatic application of rotation matrices. And that's going to be the one that we're going to use in all uh, numerical uh, problems. So the second use, well, let's first write one vector, say u, in two reference frames. Reference frame A and reference frame B, just, in, just for the sake of uh, generality, the discussion, okay? Now, reference frame u, if you were to express it in terms of its components in reference frame A, you could write it just like that. Hopefully this isn't new to you, because that was one of the first things uh, we saw in orbital mechanics. Turns out the same vector could also be expressed in terms of its x, y, z components, but this time with respect to another reference frame, u, b. So although you're talking about the exact same vector, the x, y, z components of the same vector will be totally different depending on which point of view you want to measure the x, y, z components, okay? Point of view or reference frame, same thing, okay? And because, obviously, the vector exists independently of any reference frame that you happen to define to be able to give yourself a basis from which you're going to measure the x, y, z components of the vector, is going to be equal to itself which means that transpose of vectrix A times component of vector U seen in reference frame A, matrix, the underlying notation, don't forget that, is going to be exactly equal to vectrix B transpose times components of vector U in reference frame B. Now what we're going to do to that equation is take the dot product on both sides with vectrix B. So here we go vectrix B dot product with vectrix A transpose times U A equal to vectrix B dot product with its transpose times U in reference frame B in terms of components like that, okay? Again, <clears throat> this here gives you the identity matrix 3 by 3, 
which when multiplied with a three by one would just give you back the three by one column matrix. This is going to be equal to vector x b dot product transpose of vector a times u components seen in reference frame a. Just like that. Huh. Do you guys recognize this? Well, yes, we do. That's just what we saw previously, right? When we went and demonstrated that our rotation matrix is in fact the same as the direction cosine matrix, we had a rotation matrix on this side equal to the exact same uh, operation here. So where we had taking the column matrix of unit vectors of B dot product, we transpose of the vectrix with unit vectors of A, ended up with a three by three matrix filled, filled with a bunch of cos trig functions. So essentially, that means that U B is equal to, and again, this is C B A equal to C B A, the rotation matrix that describes the orientation of reference frame B with respect to reference frame A, and never the other way around, okay, times U A. Wow, how powerful is that? That is actually the second use of a rotation matrix, in which a rotation matrix is then and now employed or used to convert the X, Y, Z components of a, of a given vector seen in a reference frame to the components of the same vector, but this time seen from a totally different reference frame, A and B in that case, okay? And that is the more practical use of rotation matrices. So if you know the orientation of one reference frame with respect to another one through the quantification of this matrix, or in other words, you've been able to fill this three by three matrix with actual numbers, and I were to give you the X, Y, Z components of vectors seen in the initial reference frame, A, you could easily just multiply CBA, CBA with UA and obtain components of vector U, but this time seen in the second reference frame, which here is B. Okay? So I'm going to write that now. This is used to transform. the x, y, z components of a given vector could be whatever vector from a reference frame to another one. Second use of rotation matrices, and again, this is a more practical use of it. Fantastic. Good. Now, CBA, again, just about a thing in the subscripts, has to have the UA on, the right, on its right and the UB to its left, because the Bs have to be together in terms of subscripts, and the As have to be together. But well, what if I were to give you CBA and UB, and your job will be to figure out UA? It's a kind of the inverse problem. Well, you couldn't use directly that equation as it is because now this is given to you, this is given to you, and now the unknown stands on the right-hand side of that equation. Well, that's not too big of a deal because all you have to do is take the inverse of this equation well, the inverse of the rotation matrix and apply it to both sides, such that you would end up with C B A inverse times U B on this side, and on the other side, you would get C B A inverse times C B A. Right? I've just applied the inverse of C B A to that side as well, times. U A. 
the inverse of a three by three matrix times itself will always give you the identity matrix. Or in other words, a three by three matrix uh, that has ones on the lead diagonal and zeros elsewhere, okay? And then we said from before that a three by three matrix times a column matrix, three by one, will only give you the three by one, okay? Equal to C, B, A, inverse, times UB, right? Because the problem is that given UB and CBA, how to solve for UA? Isn't that easy? All you have to do to solve that is take the inverse of that rotation matrix. But wait, hold on a second. The inverse of a three by three matrix? Well, no, that's not easy at all. And I would agree with you, especially if you have to do it Real quick on an, on an exam where you don't have access to MATLAB simulink, you have to do it by hand. Okay? Turns out that rotation matrices have special properties, one of which is that the inverse of a rotation matrix is equivalent, and it will always be the case, to its transpose. Oh, thank God. This is so much better. So now instead of taking the inverse of this rotation matrix, you're telling me that all I would have to do is take CBA that you gave me, transpose it, and do times UB, and that would give me the answer? Well, yes. And that is a walk in the park for you, right? Because the transpose of a three by three is just another three by three with which you flip the rows with the columns. Not that big of a deal. So either you leave it like that, but a cleaner representation of that is to realize that whenever you take the transpose of a rotation matrix, what it does is that it flips the subscripts around. So CBA transpose becomes CAB times UB. And I'll give you UA. And that's good news because now, by virtue of the fact that the transpose operator flipped not only the rows with column, but the subscripts, now if you look at what we end up with, then we have something that works out because the A's are next to each other and the subscripts B are next to each other. Congrats. Okay? So in other words, throughout this course and in your engineering career, you should never, never, never have to calculate the inverse of a rotation matrix, because the inverse is just the transpose, okay? So given CBA and UB, if you want UA, say, okay, easy peasy, I'm gonna write it to the proper subscripts. Boy, that's not what you're giving me, but I know that CAB is actually what you are giving me, transpose, boom, answer. So take the transpose of CBA times UB and that was going to give you UA, okay? Nice. So now that we've understood the two uh, uses of rotation matrices, let's have a look at another, another interesting property of rotation matrices. The first one is that the inverse is equal to the transpose. Now was quite a good news. The second uh, special property of rotation matrices is, is that they can be uh, multiplied together or stacked together just by making sure that the subscripts kind of work and that would work out at the end of the day. Okay, so let me show that to you. And that is the successive or consecutive rotations. Okay, so now Let's go back to some generic vector that we shall call u, or so u vector, and let's have a look at this random vector in 3D space from three different reference frames. In other words, we're going to measure the x, y, z components of this vector in reference frame A, defined with ax, ay, and z. We'll also measure or figure out the components of the same vector, but this time from a reference frame which is oriented differently. Like that. 
so dx dy dz and then we're going to throw a third one in the picture so a third reference frame and this time this one could be oriented randomly something like that and it's cx cy and cz unit vector like this okay so for those of you who hadn't understood that the components of a given vector depends on which reference frame you're looking at those components while well, hopefully this diagram uh, shed some light uh, but if you still hadn't wrapped your head around that I wonder how you pass orbital mechanics okay because <laughs> we did a lot of it in orbital mechanics uh, but essentially clearly for example here the components of this vector u seen in reference frame b would be all along b y so the components along x would be zero along z would be zero right just assuming that this is parallel to b y whereas in reference frame a you would get non-zero x y z components because this vector would be like this as reported to the origin of this reference frame okay and so on and so on in here that vector looks to be aligned parallel to CX, so without any uh, Y and Z components, and here U is all along Y, okay? So all this to say that the components of a vector depends on the reference frame you're looking uh, at it, and I'm gonna, and I'm not gonna repeat that ever again because this is fundamental knowledge of Curtis course, which was a prerequisite for that one, okay? so. Let's go back to our discussion here about consecutive rotations or successive rotations. And let's write down U vector in terms of its components seen in reference frame A. Which is going to be this. We're going to do the same thing in reference frame B. Like this. And we can also do the same thing in reference frame uh, C. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now we know how to use rotation matrices to relate this to that and or to this, UB to UA and UC and UC to UB and UA, right? We know all, we know how to cross those bridges through the proper use of rotation matrices such that we could very well come in and say components of vector u and c would be equal to c c b times components of u and vector b All right and the reason why i've been able to pick the right rotation matrix matrix is just by looking at the subscript the c's are next to each other the b's are next next to each other so that works out i can also say that I don't know, UB related to components in reference frame A like that. Okay. Do I need another one? And I can also relate directly UC to UA through C, C, A. Just like that. Okay, just playing with the components in whatever reference frame and writing those in terms of components in some other reference frames through the smart use of rotation matrices like that. Okay, that's not rocket science. So what's the relationship between this and successive rotations? Well, is that when you start combining them together, we are going to get, for example, if you were to swap out UB in that expression with this, then we're going to get that UC is equal to CCB times UB, where UB is CBA times UA, like that. Oh, wait, didn't you just tell me that UC was CCAUA? Yeah, that works out too. I don't tend to lie. <laughs> so those two things are valid. 
So then I could equate QC with QC and write, or just by visual inspection directly tell that this better be equivalent to that. Otherwise, we have a fundamental mathematical problem here. But we don't have a problem. So that means that C, CA has to be equal to C, CB, C, B, A. Ah, now I understand that property of successive rotations. Because that means that C, C, A could be, which is the orientation of reference frame C, which is fact to reference frame A, could be obtained by multiplying two other rotation matrices where the inner subscripts match and cancel out such that you are indeed left with C, A. Okay, so if you look, the Bs are next to each other. In that case, we pretend that they kind of cancel out. And you get C, C, A equal to C, C, cancel, cancel, A. So in other words, you can throw an intermediate reference frame between A and C and do the path from A to B and B to C and end up the same thing as A to C, okay? It's as if you're going from uh, Montreal to Quebec, Montreal being A, Quebec being C, but here you decided to stop in between at a rest area, which is B. So even though you went from Montreal to the rest area and then to the rest area to Quebec City, and it's the same thing as going from Montreal to Quebec City in terms of uh, fuel spent, for example, right? But that works out uh, to our advantage because in the next section, we're gonna look at uh, principal rotations and how to stack three of them uh, right next to each other. And yeah, that's just a little trick that's gonna help us tremendously throughout this course. And that works out. You can stack as many of them as you want. So if you're looking for C, S, A, relationship between reference frame F and reference frame A, and that could be obtained as C, F, E times C, E, D times C, D, C, and so on and so on. And also you can skip a step and say C, C, A, right? So the C's cancel out, the D's cancel out, the E's cancel out, and you're left indeed with C, F, A, okay? There's no limit to that uh, successive uh, stacking of rotation matrices one after the other. Okay? Great. Well, we're making good progress. All right. Next up in 1.2, which is also a review of what was seen in orbital mechanics as the concept of principal rotations. Okay, so a principal rotation is the one through which one reference frame is obtained from another one through a single rotation about one of the unit vectors of the original reference frame. So if the order is to go from reference frame A, as the initial reference frame, up to reference frame B, then if you know that the relationship between those two reference frames happen to be a single rotation, either about AX or about AY or about AZ to obtain reference frame B, then that specific rotation is referred to as a principal rotation because you had rotated about one of the three unit vectors of the reference frame you had originally and not some arbitrary orientation in 3D space as a rotation axis through which you spin to go from A to B. Because again, the axis of rotation happened to be AX, AY, or AZ. That is the fundamental idea behind principal rotations as opposed to some generic rotations. Principle means that you are spinning or you are rotating the initial reference frame about one of its three principle or one of its three unit vectors to obtain the new reference frame. 
Now, depending about which referent or about which unit vector you, ha you happen to be rotating to go from A to B, then that rotation matrix will look completely different. Okay? So I'm going to give you the three building blocks to go from one reference frame to a second one when the relationship, again, is a single rotation. It takes you from A to B, but that rotation happens to be about one of the three principles or one of the three unit vectors of reference frame A. Now, say the relationship is through a rotation about the AX unit vector. We're going to call that uh, rotation matrix associated with that rotation C1 or equivalently CX. Both notations are perfectly equivalent. I'm going to use them interchangeably throughout the course. It doesn't matter. You can pick one and stick with it or use both or it's really up to you. And we're going to say that the angle through which we rotated reference frame A, about one of its three unit vectors, to go to reference frame B was denoted by theta x. Okay, that's the angle of rotation about the x unit vector. Well, whenever that is the situation we have, it means that the 3 by 3 rotation matrix will always be replaced by the following. So three functions in the middle. I'm going to use C for cos, the conciseness, and S to denote the sine trig function. So cos of the angle of rotation, sine of the angle of rotation, minus sine of the angle of rotation, theta x, and cos of theta x. Okay? And visually, that's when, if that is reference frame A, Uh, okay, let's do AX to the right, AY on top, and AZ here. If A is like this, but then if B, the final reference frame, was obtained through a single rotation about AX through some angle theta X, so that would give you BX, which would be collinear with AX because AX being the axis of rotation. This wouldn't change Vx. By would then be slightly tilted uh, out of the board towards you by an angle theta x. That would become By. And Az, which was straight out of the board, perpendicular to the board, would be slightly down by some angle theta x. Okay? So that's what it means. Therefore, in that situation, CBA, which is the relationship between uh, reference frame B and reference frame A, would be equal to C1 or equal to CX, the same thing, and CBA at the end of the day would be calculated practically using that equation. So always, when the relationship is a uh, rotation about X direction, can always go back to the notes and swap out the, the rotation matrix with this expression. Okay? Good. So that is C1 or Cx. The next principal rotation we're going to have a look at is referred to as C2 or Cy. C2 through an angle denoted theta y or Cy through the same angle. Those two things are equivalent. Whenever that is the situation, so whenever the final reference frame was obtained from the original one to a single rotation about the y principal vector of the first reference frame or about the y unit vector of the first reference frame, roll back to this and just swap out the rotation matrix with 0, 1, 0, 0, 0. Here that would be cos of the angle of rotation minus sine of the same angle, sine of the angle of rotation, and cos of the angle of rotation. Okay? This will always be valid. So again, if you want to see it visually, and you are dealing with the initial reference frame, which is reference frame A, like this, and you want to obtain a reference frame B, 
from this original orientation, then if you're spinning only about a y, you're going to get a b reference frame where it's x unit vector bx instead of being on the whiteboard plane to my right, it's going to be tilted slightly inside the plane, inside the board, through an angle theta y. Ay would be collinear with by, because Ay was the axis of rotation through which you had spun this reference frame through an angle theta y to obtain a reference frame b. And then Az, which was originally perpendicular to the whiteboard coming at you will now be slightly tilted to the right. That would be your BZ, okay? So you take the original A reference frame and you just spin it counterclockwise about AYs and you would obtain reference frame B. Whenever that is the case, go back here and swap out the rotation matrix with that exact equation here, okay? Okay, Razmad, let's keep moving forward. The third principle rotation is, surprise, surprise, a rotation about the Z unit vector. So that is going to be CZ through an angle denoted theta Z. Oh, sorry, that was my one, two, three. So C3, theta Z, and that is CZ an angle theta z, okay? So C3 is equivalent to Cz, and again, I'm going to use both uh, way of talking about the same thing in this course. Whenever that is the case, whenever the final reference frame was obtained through single rotation about the principal z unit vector of the original one, and the rotation matrix between both is going to be equal to cos of the angle of rotation, sine of the angle of rotation minus sine theta z and cos theta z like that. Okay? So that's when you obtain one reference frame through a single rotation about one of the three unit vectors that was part of the original reference frame and swapping out the rotation matrix with either cx, cy, cz. But in practice, it is very rare that we can obtain the relationship between two reference frames through a single rotation about one of the three unit vectors. Because the most generic situation is where you have a random orientation of the final reference frame with respect to some uh, orientation of the initial reference frame. In which case, one rotation about one of the three unit vectors of the original reference frame will not be sufficient to take you to the final orientation. And in that case, where you have that generic or random orientation, you need to stack principal rotations together, okay? And for three-dimensional generic orientations, we would need three principal rotations stacked one after the other that would completely describe the orientation of any reference frame with respect to any other one, okay? Uh, but what you have to consider is in which order are you spinning first the original reference frame and then what, or, what axis are you using to spin the intermediate reference frame obtained after the first rotation and then finally what will be the third axis of spin to get you from uh, the intermediate to the final one, okay? So the order with which you stack the principal rotations from a given initial reference frame will give you different answers, okay? So if I give you two different reference frames, there might be only one solution for the order with which you need to rotate to end up where you need to be, okay? So the order with which you stack the principal rotations is crucial. Turns out in most aerospace applications, a common scheme for stacking principal rotations is the three, two, one rotation 
sequence. That is kind of a standard accepted in the aerospace industry that works out for most applications. So the rotation sequence as given to you, in that case 3, 2, 1, is related to the physical order with which you perform the principal rotations. Okay? The first number given to you for the sequence corresponds to the first physical rotation. The second number corresponds to the principal rotation you're going to use for the second physical rotation. And the last number corresponds to which of the three principal rotations you're going to use to perform the last and the third physical rotation. Okay? Those numbers could be either 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, or 1, 2, 3, because we only have three choices of principal rotations for a given rotation. So the sequence could be, I just said that the 3, 2, 1 was one of the most used in aerospace applications, but you could think about a 3, 1, 2, or a 2, 3, 1, a 2, 1, 3, and so on and so on, just by swapping the order with which you use the principal rotations as building blocks to come up with the sequence, okay? So let's pretend that that rotation sequence, the 3, 2, 1, describes the orientation of reference frame B with respect to reference frame A. And the reason why I've specified uh, both the initial reference frame, A, and the final one obtained after performing that sequence is because I needed some kind of examples to keep going with that explanation, okay? So let's break down this 3, 2, 1 rotation sequence one step at a time, or one principal rotation at a time, and see what we end up with in terms of the final rotation matrix, okay? So what we need to understand again, uh, might sound like a broken record, but the rotation sequence is paramount. If you don't read the sentence in an exam that will be similar to this properly, then you will most likely end up with zero for that question because the first step, which is understanding the sequence or the order with which you perform the principal rotation, will be totally wrong and therefore the answer uh, is going to be totally wrong as well. So what's going to happen if you go in that example from A to B is that you have your starting reference frame A. Then you perform the first physical rotation about which of its three unit vectors? Well, just refer to the rotation sequence and understood, understand or recall that the first physical rotation is the first number in that sequence that happened to be three, meaning that you go from the initial reference frame to some intermediate reference frame through the rotation C3 through an angle theta Z. So you took your reference frame A and you spun it about AZ through some angle theta Z. That's done. And then the second step, you use the result of that first rotation, which was the intermediate reference frame denoted by A prime. And then you spin it about which of its three unit vectors. Is it AX prime, AY prime, or AZ prime? Well, just go back to the sequence because the second rotation that takes place is the second number in that sequence. And that would give you some other intermediate reference frame, F A double prime, and that relationship between those two would be a C2 principal rotation through an angle theta Y. And lastly, while you take the result of that second step, which was the uh, reference frame A double prime, and then you spin it about its x unit vector. So you spin that reference frame about ax double prime, and that would give you the final reference frame, which is reference frame b, and the relationship here 
just look at the sequence, it tells you that this is C1 to an angle theta x, okay? So this is, again, the first physical rotation to take place, the second one, and the third one. And the reason why I knew that it was 3, 2, 1, and not 2, 1, 3, or 1, 2, 1, or 2, 3, 1, is because the rotation sequence was given to me, and I knew how to decode or to read that properly, okay? And apply this to this example. Good. So, essentially here, if you look at what we had originally going from A to A prime through C3, then that is equivalent to say that this is a rotation matrix denoted A prime with respect to A. Right? Initial reference frame A, final after the first step A prime. So C A prime A C3. Here the rotation matrix describing the orientation of double prime with respect to prime can be denoted by C A double prime A prime. And lastly, the rotation matrix corresponding to the last principal rotation could be denoted C B. A double prime. So if the question is what would be the relationship between the final reference frame B and the initial reference frame A, or in other words, what is the orientation of reference frame B with respect to A as quantified through the, that rotation matrix, then using the principle of successive rotation with uh, rotation matrices, we could rewrite that as being the product of C, B, A double prime times C, A double prime, A prime, and then C, A prime, A. Correct? And the reason why I've been able to do that uh, right on top of my head on the fly is because I know that the subscripts are next to each other, like that, and cancel out. And we talked about that in the past, okay? So that is the generic way of writing CBA, but I know in my specific example for that given rotation sequence, CBA double prime corresponds to my C1, and that is according to the sequence, okay? So I'm going to write C1 through theta x, CA double prime A prime, just go back here, oh, that, that's that one, CA double prime A prime. We had established that, that was C2 according to the sequence. I'm just writing C2 theta y. And then lastly, C A prime A, go back to what we had, C A prime A, we had established that, that was C3. C3 through some angle denoted theta z. And that will give you the result for C B A. Now, I've done the work uh, explicitly going through each individual principal rotation one at a time according to the sequence that was given to me. But there's a trick that you can use to go a lot faster than that without having to do any of this. And that is to read the sequence, three, two, one sequence. And then, well, Three to one sequence that describes B with respect to A. So this part of the sentence tells me that this is a sequence for CBA. So I'm going to write CBA equal to three to one. Now, a lot of you have done that probably in orbital mechanics as a mistake. And you said, oh, that's easy. Three, two, one, right? Three to one is my sequence. Well, no, it doesn't work. As we've just demonstrated by doing it step by step, we had established that to construct the rotation matrix from A to B as three consecutive principal rotation was actually the opposite order. Because look at what we had established here. For the three, two, one rotation sequence, the answer for CBA was C1, C2, C3, or three, two, one, right to left. So quick, I always use myself when I want to go quick and I don't want to bother with this. 
and I don't need to do that anymore because I've played with rotation matrices extensively in my career. You just use a rotation sequence, flip it upside down, and write it like that. 3, 2, 1 sequence is C1 times C2 times, times C3. But this is specific to the 3, 2, 1 rotation sequence, right? And that is very important because I had some students in the past and I was giving them a question in the exam, so give, give me or calculate the rotation matrix from B to A when the rotation sequence is 2, 1, 3, for example. They went back to their lecture notes, oh, rotation sequence, and they gave me that. Come on, no. This is very specific to the 3, 2, 1 sequence, okay? Because here, all this work was specific to the sequence. All I did was to decode the wording and turn them into mathematical uh, operations, okay? So I went from A to A prime through C3 because that was the first number of the sequence. Then C2 because that was the second number. And finally, I've used C1 because that was the last number. And that rotation sequence would have been otherwise. This whole thing would have been different and therefore this would have been different and the answer would have been different, okay? So as a quick exercise, if I were to give you a rotation sequence of two, one, three, sequence, and that describes the orientation, we have the same wording, sequence for orientation of and to spice it up a little bit, we're going to change B and A with reference frame S with respect to reference frame U, my initials, SU, Steve Oliver, okay? All right, so S with respect to U, he must be talking about CSU then, because that is the rotation matrix that mathematically describes orientation of S with respect to U. And that would be correct. Now he gave me a 3, 2, 1 sequence. And I remember the trick he, the prof gave me. And that was to flip the order upside down and then write it like that. So 2, 3, 1, right to left. 2, or 2, 1, 3. 2, 1, 3, boom. And that is the answer. As simple as that. Okay? And that's not coming out of nowhere. We did all the work step by step and established that the sequence in terms of writing the individual principal rotation is in the reverse order, where you go from right to left instead of going left to right. Hopefully that is 100% clear, because again, if you get it wrong, I mean, this is the very fundamental of describing the orientation of one reference frame with respect to another one through principal rotations. So if you don't understand that, how are you going to be able to control then the orientation of one reference frame with respect to another one and play with the, this concept, okay? So make sure that this is uh, absolutely clear and feel free to rewatch this first lecture where we kind of went over uh, some basics that we had seen in orbital mechanics. Uh, yeah, because otherwise your foundation won't be rock solid for what will be coming up next in this course, which ultimately will be about applying what uh, you are learning or learned or will learn, I'm not too sure, in uh, feedback control systems, which, well, technically that is a prerequisite for this course. So what you should have seen in feedback control system in terms of designing proportional, proportional derivative controller, phase lead, phase lag, controllers or compensators, and how to apply all the great theories in terms of linear system analysis and uh, pole placement, controller design, specifically to solve the problem of spacecraft attitude control. Okay? I'm going to stop here for the first lecture of Aero 4540. 
I hope that that was kind of a reminder of what you already knew or would have learned maybe a couple of semesters ago. Uh, hope you enjoyed. I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.